the question of a, a, for a socialist Labour government. We're meeting in the aftermath of one of the, one of the most radical Labour conferences, actually, uh, that we've seen for a long time. There was a very radical mood there. They passed, uh, the party passed policies like abolishing private schools, huge investment in social care in the NHS, and so on. And uh, as everyone in this room will be aware, there was a, a big vote in favour of uh, the reintroduction of Clause 4 into the Labour Party constitution from uh, CLP delegates, which is a real... Uh, What an achievement that is to, to be finally removing this, this Blairite stain on the, on the Labour movement in Britain uh, from the Labour Party's constitution. And, uh, and with that behind us, what we've got in front of us, obviously we're on the brink of Brexit in one form or another. We're also uh, expecting big strike action from the CWU in uh, the next period, uh, possibly also from UCU. Uh, I've just mentioned the McDonald's workers also. Uh, there's basically in society now a big mood and a big need for a Labour government to power on a socialist programme, um, which obviously we are, uh, that's what we're here today to discuss and we're fully in favour of that. We're going to be campaigning for that as much as possible. Now, uh, yeah, well, I'll introduce the speakers. Now, we've got excellent uh, speakers for, for you this evening from a, with a range of experience from different backgrounds, the Labour movement, and uh, the student movement. I do also have uh, to give to the, to the meeting this evening greetings from Mark Sawatka, who was uh, gutted that he couldn't be here this evening, but he wanted to send his greetings uh, to the meeting. Mark Sawatka is currently standing for re-election to be the General Secretary uh, of the PCS Union, which is a, a, a militant, a radical left union. Mark spoke on the platform at the Labour for Clause 4 rally at the Labour Party conference and he delivered a very militant speech in the conference itself. So it's great to have his greetings to the meeting this evening. <laughs> and so now to our first speaker. We've got uh, Mike Hogan, first of all, from Liverpool Wavertree CLP. Mike was one of the movers of the Clause 4 motion at the Labour Party conference just a few weeks ago. He's been he's very active in the Clause 4 campaign. He's the, the main coordinator of the campaign on uh, Merseyside. So we're very pleased, first of all, to introduce Mike. <coughs> uh, thanks. Thanks, Ben. I, I just want to go through the situation, being from Liverpool Wavertree, because my MP this week, uh, really poor, talking about staying of the Blairites, my MP this week actually supported, failed to vote, and fa along with the rest of the Liberal Democrats, failed to support a Labour Party motion in order to stop the Health and Social Care Act, to repeal the Health and Social Care Act, which the Labour Party, Jeremy Corbyn put forward, as being essential if, if we were to go to a no-deal Brexit to, to defend the NHS. And we have a Liberal Democrat MP in, in Liverpool Wavertree, despite the fact that the Liberal Democrats got 3,000 votes, a twelfth of the vote of Labour in, a, in our constituency, which was up on the previous election. And yet we have a Liberal Democrat MP who has now shown her support for austerity and shown her support for privatisation. And in that last election, she said that the Health and Social Care Act put, put, put profits before patients. And that's no surprise because the Blair wing of our party is the pro, uh, uh, Blair wing of the Labour Party is the pro-capitalist wing of our party. The progress and all the rest of the parasites are there merely to support capitalism and to keep capitalism safe from the likes of us. Well, we're here to, to prove them wrong. And what has happened in our party is that she is, obviously she's now joined the Liberal Democrats. Somebody asked me on the streets of Liverpool, how do you feel about the fact that your MP has left the Labour Party? Well, I felt like, I said, I feel like sending her a cake and a congratulations because she's gone. Because in Liverpool Wavertree, the Labour Party members and the Labour voters did not want the kind of politics that we get from the Blairites. We've now had another defection to, uh, we've now had another defection from the Labour Party in the seat next door with Louise Elman. And this, to us, this is a cause of celebration. 
It's a cause of celebration when the Blairites leave the party because it has become uncomfortable for them. And I say that for one practical reason. This rally is about fighting for a socialist Labour government. And one of the biggest dangers to that socialist Labour government would be let P MPs being elected as Labour MPs and then refusing to support the programme that we did at Ben mentioned a conference. Refusing to support a, a Labour government and putting her, putting her in a, a, a chaos. So we need, desperately need that socialist Labour government because of austerity and, all, and, and, and the rest of it. But I want to go back to why I support and why I, why I became a socialist and a Marxist. I joined a very long time ago. We'll be discussing history and the history of the movement uh, during this weekend. I joined the Young Socialists in 1977. And, and, the, and, the, uh, and the militants in 1978. And the reason why I did that, because I lived on a council estate in Liverpool. And on that council estate, which was connected to an industrial estate, in 1977, 78 and 79, before the advent of Margaret Thatcher, we saw deindustrialization on a grand scale. We saw factories closing and manufacturing industry being ripped out of our community and, and workers being thrown on, onto the dole. And I say that for, for one very important reason. It's because when Margaret Thatcher came in and started to attack the working class, but the, the, the problems that we faced in the 1980s were the problems rooted in the crisis of capitalism. They weren't because of the Tories were particularly evil. We used to say in the militants that, that, that uh, Margaret Thatcher is not attacking the working class because she's evil. She's evil. She probably is. But she's not attacking us because of that. She's attacking us because she's representing her, her particular class. The only, the only uh, explanation that I got for what I saw around me that made sense was the ideas of Marxism. I saw every, every, every uh, so often cars being heaped up in, in every spare place around the estate where I lived. I, and that was because of the crisis of overproduction of capitalism. I saw when a, when a factory closed in, in uh, Speak, the Dunlop's factory, what, what we call a special crisis of British capitalism, a, a, a factory where there was total uh, lack of investment in that factory. And I say this, and, th and this movement led to us, Marxists in Liverpool, taking a stand against Margaret Thatcher's government. We took a stand in Liverpool City Council, and we took a stand to fight back uh, against that particular government. And that particular, that, partic sorry, sorry. that particular fight was led by Marxists and led by revolutionaries. And why was it that revolutionaries led that particular fight? Why was it that we took, we took that course? Because we had the confidence in working class people in Liverpool. We had the confidence that, that given a radical lead, given... A, a, a fighting lead against Thatcher that we could, we could see a mass campaign. And we saw a mass campaign on the streets, 50,000 uh, su uh, demonstrations supporting the council. We saw the Labour vote double within, within, the, within the city, up to 90,000. So radical policies work, and radical policies are popular. We saw that in the last general election. We saw 3.5 million votes added by a radical manifesto and as by a socialist leader of our party. We have the confidence that we can take those socialist ideas uh, forward. But I want to go back uh, uh, to, to this point about why we're facing the, the, this issue today. We're facing austerity today because austerity is, is the, uh, austerity has resulted from the crisis of British capitalism. It's resulted from that, that deep-rooted crisis. And I look at it in this way that when that crisis hits, the capitalists, the, 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 the bosses in society are not going to make sacrifices. You think about the conversations that were had in Thomas Cook. You think about when Thomas Cook was, was, going, uh, was going towards its crash, that the conversations at the top of that particular organisation amongst those bosses were, were, well, we're not going to lose our bonuses. We're not going to lose our, our, uh, our big... Uh, uh, we're, we're not going to... A, a sacrifice uh, as a result of this. It's the 9,000 workers are going to be sacrificed. 
22,000 workers across the world who are going to be sacrificed. And who cares about the people who are going to be stranded uh, all across the planet? As so long as our wealth is safe, then who cares? And that is the general attitude of the capitalist class. That is the general attitude that is seen through in austerity. Austerity is nothing more than what Marx said is a class war over, over the share of wealth in this society. And they're going to make sure that when, when economic crisis happens, that it's our share that gets cut, not their share. And that's why we need a socialist campaign. And the Labour for Clause 4 campaign has raised the ideas, the fundamental ideas of socialism within, our, within the Labour Party. It's done, done that across the country. It's done that uh, uh, in, a, in a very, uh, in, in a great way uh, across, uh, across uh, you know, across the Labour Party. And it's got a real echo. And it's got a real echo uh, from workers. It's got a real echo from the constituencies. It even got an echo from the leadership. And I noted Rebecca Long-Bailey's speech because Rebecca Long-Bailey quoted the Socialist Clause 4. She quoted the Socialist Clause 4 after she said something else significant. She said, if all we're going to do is, is, is uh, support watered-down austerity, then we might as well go home now. If all that we're doing is supporting that, we might as well go home now. Because what we should be about is changing society. And we say, we're, we're with you, Rebecca, we're with you on that in wanting to change society. Because that fundamental change is needed. And I'll end on, on, on this point on a, on a sort of personal note of why we need to see an end to capitalism, we need to see real progress in, in, in our society and, and amongst our communities. When I, was, when I was born, which was a very long time ago, when I was born, I'm not going to tell you how long ago, when I was born, my father had to leave his job. He worked on the docks in Liverpool. He was a Liverpool docker. And at that time, Liverpool dockers, it was a casual occupation. You worked depending on whether your face fitted. You worked depending on whether you were picked for work that day. And he left the docks and he got a job in a factory because he needed steady income because I, I'd come along. Well, during the 60s and 70s, the dockers in Liverpool and the dockers around the country and the docks like Tilbury in London fought against that casualisation. They fought a titanic battle to get proper, decent, civilised terms and conditions. And they fought and won that battle in, in what, was, what was called the dock labour scheme. But in, in the 1990s in Liverpool, the dockers were locked out and they were betrayed by the trade union, I have to say, betrayed by the then the Transport and General Workers Union. And, and because of that, that led to a defeat. But also beca because of the defeats that some of the, uh, uh, the, those uh, situations. We've seen the return on a grand scale of, of precarious work. We've seen the return of casualization on a grand scale. Uh, where if you, you're, a, you're a student, you could be the person, you could have a precarious p uh, people uh, involved in your life from the person who brings you a pizza to your teacher in, in your university or college could be on a precarious contract. So the fight of our movement against casualisation, which was won at a certain stage, if you win fights and you win reforms, the first thing the bosses do and the first thing the bourgeois do is to try and take them back off you. And, it, and then becomes a continual battle and, it, and all, all your life is involved in a continual struggle. Well, I don't think that humanity should be involved in eternal struggle just for the basics of life. We should, be, we, we, should release the, we should release human beings from that basic struggle. Within this room, there's probably enormous talent. There's a, probably enormous political talent, but there's also enormous artistic talent, scientific talent, and other, and other talent within this room. Socialism will release that talent. Socialism will release us from this e eternal a treadmill of having to struggle to survive. And I want to end on the words, and, and it's a very fitting that we have uh, Irish comrades in the room. I want to end on the words of James Connolly. And James Connolly said, in a, he, he wrote a, a poem, a song, and he said that our demands most moderate are, we only want the earth. And what I want to add to that is why not? Why shouldn't we have the earth? On the behalf of, the, of, of, of humanity, on behalf of the of the toiling masses of the world, why shouldn't they uh, control the earth and take it from the billionaires and the billionaire class?
Um, uh, in 1975, I voted to leave the common market, and there was a massive debate at that time, and the trade unions were two-thirds in favour of leaving it. And what the trade unions thought at the time turned out to be true, that the industry would go to Germany, the finance would go to, Fran uh, to Britain, and the farming subsidies would go to France, and working-class people knew that. And that was the prerequisite, really, for, for, for Thatcher. And people, you know, they talk about the free movement of labour, within the EU. In 1974, I went to Germany. I, I didn't know you needed a passport. I turned up in Wakefield and they said, we're going at 12 o'clock, Paul. You need a passport. I went to the post office and I bought one and they gave you it. And that's what it was like. Tonight, I've had to provide a passport to stop in an hotel in London. And that's the free movement of labour from, from Wakefield to London. Uh, <laughs> I went to a meeting last Saturday in Wakefield on the history of the Labour Party in Wakefield. Like most people who's in the Labour Party, I know my own area from the day I joined it, but not necessarily before that, and it was a really interesting debate. Wakefield, unbelievably, in 19... The MP for Wakefield Earl was returned unopposed, but his father died two years later, and uh, he went to be the Earl of Fitzwilliam, and there was a by-election. And I read the report from the Yorkshire Post, at the time about the Labour campaign and God does nothing change in 117 years. It said, I went to the Labour Party rooms, outside the Labour Party rooms were very shifty people leaning on lampposts looking extremely foreign. <laughs> that was in 1904, in Wakefield where foreigners probably came from Rotherham and Sheffield. <laughs> But what also interesting was some of the names they talked about who were Tory councillors at the time. For people from, like I am from Wakefield, for people like me, they weren't people. They were the names of all the big factories in Wakefield. All the names that came out on the Tory roll was the names. And it, it described, you know, I don't need to tell this, a factory in Wakefield, it doesn't matter what it was. But every Friday morning, the owner of the factory came to the factory in his hunting gear, on his horse, to make sure everybody was all right before he went fox hunting. That was the sort of per person that was representing Wakefield. And I learned the massive amount of my political life in the miners' strike. Because you learn things from talking to people and listening. And a lot of miners said to me, Paul, this strike's not about coal. And I couldn't understand that. In Wakefield, there were 30,000 miners and 20 pits. And I couldn't understand why it wasn't about coal, because everything on the telly was talking about are we overproducing coal, are we under... You all know the debates, don't you? My mate said, look, Paul, if we'd worked 24 hours a day, seven days a week, for plain time and the minimum wage, there'd be more pits opening. It's about the organisation of the industrial working class in Britain. And I realise now... What's, I knew it was a big dispute in it. Everybody knew it was a big dispute by the number of police that were living in your village. But... It was the defining post-war moment for British industry, really. Every union meeting you went to after that, people said, well, the miners couldn't win. And I think what's interesting, I think Ken Livingston's only ever said one thing that I agree with. He might have said some other things. I haven't been taping him. I don't know what he's been saying. <laughs> but he said, I saw him say on the telly, one of the problems is that working class people are too busy living to join things. Middle class people have got loads and loads of time. They dominate the, through the connections. You know, I, you know I, I went to a Labour Party meeting the other night and the first two speakers, for some reason in the trigger ballot meeting, had to tell the meeting that they were both doctors. What that had to do with the Labour selection meeting, I don't know. But Chomsky said, I told them to cultural references all over the shop. Norm Chomsky said, and he's right, 1% own society, 85% produce a wealth in society, and 14% get well paid to confuse you that the 1% should own it. And then 14% are journalists and politicians and news reporters and barristers and solicitors, etc., etc. I saw somebody on Question Time the other night arguing about the benefits for young people of zero hours contracts. And I'm sat there watching that, I think, how much working have you ever done? I've never done any work, but I've organised people who do do work. As like my mate Nigel used to say, he was a pit electrician, he used to say, he said it to Ian Duncan Smith once, I haven't done a lot of work, but I've been near people who were doing it. <laughs> and these people who come on the television and make things big that aren't big, Brexit's not the biggest thing in Britain, it, they make things big that aren't big, 
I said on, on the television in New York the other night, I said, look, there was only a 51% turnout in the referendum, 52% turnout in the referendum, and it was 50 and a half to 49 and a half, and we should have a second referendum on the Welsh Assembly vote of 1999. We should run it again. And because it, people's forgotten that, haven't they? They've absolutely forgotten it. That were a lower turnout and a more narrow victory. But they've decided to make Brexit the issue. And I voted leave. And I remember the BBC Two report coming down to Wakefield Labour Club. There were a dozen people there. And his theme to come down to Wakefield Labour Club, because that's state television, his theme was everybody who voted leave who's male over 50 is a racist or the thick. That's the argument, isn't it? What he didn't say, of the, of the nine regions in Britain, London was the only region that supported saying, now I ain't bothered about leaving or not leaving. That's not the big issue. The big issue is, if you drew the league tables up in Britain of school re exam results, per capita income, and outside the big cities leaving the EU, the percentage would be exactly the same. Exactly the same. Because they're all feeling the same thing, aren't it? They're all disenfranchised. Everybody's united in Wakefield as far as the eight politicians. Now, a bloke said to me the other night, you know what I hate now, Paul, about capitalists? I says, what? He says, they don't believe in competition. They hate competition. You go to school and people tell you in A-level economics or whatever it is you do, that the society's run on competition. It's run on backhanders and who you know. There's nobody, there's nobody bidding for health service contracts that wants competition. There's nobody bidding for train contracts that wants competition. They want profit by the method that's easiest for them. And the easy thing to describe it is very easy. Labour is a raw material if it's not organised. That's the only thing that differs it from power or, or, or minerals is being organised. And I remember when it, there were a lot of day pits in Wakefield. People might not remember day pits, but we weren't in London. But, you know, it's not far to the Kent Coalfield. Day pits only worked during the day. They didn't have three shifts. As the pits got bigger and pr production got mechanised, they brought in three shifts. And the lads used to say to me, I don't understand this, Paul. Management are vital to running industry. But they don't work nights. Nights are vital and management are vital, but they don't work them. And they used to say the only decent thing about working down the pit was, it's so horrible management don't go down. <laughs> but the reality of the whole thing is, and all workers understand this, they'll understand this in McDonald's, just like they'll understand it at the pit or the docks. Big Bill Haywood said, if somebody gets a dollar that they haven't earned, somebody's lost a dollar that they did earn. And all workers understand that, because that's what makes the Cayman Islands go round. Your, your dollar that you're not getting is going there for somebody to use at somebody's future date. Now, I'm going to switch now to a cultural reference that, apart from 20 of us in this room, nobody will know what I'm talking about. I'm going to talk about Dick Van Dyke. <laughs> now, and I like Dick Van Dyke. People said his accent in uh, Mary Poppins was shocking. It wasn't as shocking as Sean Connery's accent as an English upper-class person in James Bond. I'm telling you that here and now. So Dick Van Dyke, I saw him on the telly the other night, doing a fundraising rally for Bernie Saunders in San Diego. Dick Van Dyke's 94 years old. And he did, it's the first fundraising he's done since 1968, because he says it's the first candidate he could support who was a socialist since 1968. And he opened the rally up by saying he was supporting Bernie Saunders because he felt young politicians should be encouraged. <laughs> now, we're in a situation now where capitalism is in real trouble. And when it's in real trouble, it eats up people. That's what it does. And you've got to be able to see what's going on. You haven't got to think what's happening next week. Oh, Napoleon, like Napoleon now... Napoleon said to his brother, because his brother complained that Sardinian peasants were forever changing their mind, he said that the working classes, he didn't use that term, but the working classes tell you what they feel now, they'll tell you what they think tomorrow. Now, I've had sleepless nights with group of work, groups of workers where I thought, but hell, they told me they're not going to do this, and the next day I walk in thinking, well, they've got to do it. And they say, it's a good idea, that, Paul. I said, you hated it yesterday. Yeah, but I've thought about it now. Now, you don't always appreciate the problems that's in front of you. I had a meeting this morning with 100 bin workers in Huddersfield and Dewsbury about strike action. And, you, you know, 
some of the general secretaries might think that everybody lives in a three-bedroom semi, but they don't. Two of the lads said, Paul, how am I going to get a ballot paper? I live out of a car. Now, I've never heard that expression, but both of them have been thrown out of the house and were living in the yard, the bin yard, in the car. And I'd, they said, it's a great advantage, Paul. I can get there for when it starts because I've been there since 10 o'clock the night before. <laughs> so we're in a situation now where what is going to happen next? Now, Johan Cruyff, one of my heroes, said, you've got to distinguish between insight and speed. I'm not faster than the other people. I just realise what's happening earlier and to get there first. And that's what politics is about, realising what's happened. Now, you can be negative and you can think, oh, you can't organise McDonald's. Young people aren't like we were. We, we were trade unionised. They're not going to be. If you study the, the, between 1890 and 1930, the unorganised labour that weren't in the craft unions, like the Dockers, they were talked about derogatory by a lot of people. They were Irish. You couldn't organise them. They were low paid. They were undercutting workers. But Mike's right, by the 60s and 70s, they were seen with the miners as the elite. And there's no reason why that can't happen at McDonald's. There's no reason why it can't work anywhere. Some, because somebody dresses differently and wears some different workwear that somebody else uses, the exploitation is the same. Whether it's a stick tapping you on the shoulder at Liverpool docks, or it's somebody texting you at two in the morning to say you've got to be in a depot in Wakefield in an hour's time. It's the same casualisation. If you ask people in Wakefield where they work, it'll drive you bananas. You'll think they're playing bingo. If you ask people in Wakefield where they work, they say 41, 42, 30, because that's the junctions that they work on, on the M1 and the M62, in casual labour, in depots. And your remarks to a conclusion. I remember saying to my mother, she grew up in a pit village near Wakefield, in the 20s and 30s. How many Labour Party members did you know, Mother? She said, we didn't know anybody who went Labour Party. We want the sort of people that join the Labour Party. But I tell you what we did know, Paul, we knew every single word of the red flag. And that's important. What we need to do is make sure that people like my mother of this generation understand that they can join. That them people, I can't believe somebody said in Parliament last Saturday, it's a disgrace we're working on Saturday. What about childcare? That's what an MP said. What do you think it's like 365 days a year for most working people? If you go into the kitchen of a lot of workers, there's just a big calendar on the wall with each other's shifts on it, making sure, because one works in the old people's home, one works on the, on the highways or on the bins. And when I talk to people, I like to agree with them sometimes. They say to me, Paul, what do you think about benefits, people on benefits? I think they should be made to work and the benefits should be stopped. Oh, I didn't think you'd think that, Paul. No, but I don't think Prince Charles thinks it neither. <laughs> so Re Rhys Mogg, a man who says we've got to get rid of the nanny state, a man who's still got the same nanny as he had when he was born, <laughs> a man who went round canvassing with his nanny the other week, I were at a Labour Party conference and I heard Rebecca Long Bailey's speech that Mike referred to her earlier and she said something that hit the button for me because one of the debates about socialism for me is I'm not a charity person and I don't feel sorry for people. I expect to be better off under socialism. I'm not in this game like some feeling sorry for somebody who was on a short-term contract or somebody... I feel sorry that they haven't got the same benefits as I had 35 years ago, but I don't feel sorry enough to cry about it. Don't mourn, let's organise. And Rebecca Long Bailey said, and it, it got hardly no publicity, but it hit home with me. Rebecca Long Bailey said, we need to usher in an era of public luxury. And that's what socialism is about. Thank you very much, cheers. Thank you. Um, I want to start just by um, talking about the fact, or mentioning rather, that there are a lot of really powerful movements erupting all around the world at the moment that I'm sure a lot of people in the room are aware of, um, in Lebanon, in Ecuador, in Haiti. But I just particularly want to mention um, the movement in Chile that has recently erupted. 
because um, I don't know if people are aware, but recently the state announced uh, a rise in the cost of the metro, a kind of a, a fair rise. And that was immediately met with a huge backlash um, from the students in particular. The students kind of stormed all of the stations and in a kind of mass fair dodging um, um, kind of protest. And that went beyond just the students. It quickly developed into something much more radical because it was linked up with the workers, linked up with the working class in Chile. And I think that that's really significant for us um, and when we look at what's happening over there because what they are fighting a fighting against isn't just about the increase of the metro, right? And in, in, in the way that it became powerful and linked up with the working class. It was a revolt against years of austerity and years of inequality and poverty that faces the working class in that country. And that austerity that the students are facing and the workers are facing is the same fight that we're facing in this country, the same austerity that young people are fighting against here. And so I think that's something that, you know, as internationalists, obviously we have to pay a lot of attention to and stand in solidarity with the students that are fighting against austerity um, in Chile and obviously all around the world as well. Because our generation here in the UK obviously has faced 10 years of austerity now. We've grown up seeing only cuts, only cutbacks in education, in housing, in everything. And you know, this is in a country which is supposed to be the fifth largest economy in the world. And despite that, there's over 4 million children in this country that live in poverty, right? 4 million children. And that is the direct product of Tory policies. That is the direct product of austerity. Policies, and these are policies, and that austerity are all that people my age have known. This is all that we have grown up with. The entirety of my conscious political life anyway has just been austerity and cuts and capitalism in crisis. And because of these policies, what we have is young people leaving university in debt. They're entering a world of precarious work. We've heard about the zero hours contracts that young people, not just young people, the whole of the working class is forced to kind of deal with. Um, and you know, on top of that, then they, they then have to pay all of their wages on an extortionate rent price in bad housing with bad landlords. And I'm sure everyone in this room um, has a story about that. And what kind of life is that? What kind of future is that giving to young people in this country? What kind of life can we expect for all of those children, those over 4 million children living in poverty right now? How can we expect them to do well in school? How can we expect them to enrich themselves and be nourished in a full sense? If their parents are struggling to pay bills, if their parents are struggling to pay rent, how can a child develop in a safe environment if their parents are queuing up at food banks every day because they can't give them dinner, how is that child going to do their homework and actually make something of themselves in a genuine sense? <laughs> Waiting for the next benefits instalment, for example. These children are in destitution. And what future do they have, right? Looking forward in society, who do they have to, to take them out of that situation? And where are they going to end up? In fact, so bleak is their future, there's you know, a lot of people in society and a lot of children and young people growing up at the moment have no option other than to turn to crime, gang crime, knife crime in particular is on the rise and the media is going on and on about how awful this is, the rates of knife crime that they've never seen before and isn't this such a tragedy? And I mean, Boris Johnson claims to have a solution to some of these things. I think one of the, the, the kind of narratives he's going to go into the next general election with is on, you know, safe policing. We're going to increase stop and search and end knife crime and the surge of violence on our streets. This is not going to save lives, right? Let's be honest about this. In fact, there's a clear link between austerity and knife crime, and we have to point that out. Boris Johnson is not going to end austerity. Right? And it's those Tory cuts and the poverty that it induces that has compounded this knife crime epidemic. And we put the blame on them. You know, the Tories are going to blame parents, they're going to blame teachers, they're going to do everything they can, you know, missing fathers. We know the kind of cultural stereotypes they're going to whip up in this narrative. But this violence is rooted in a system based on profit. And this system, which has disenfranchised entire communities to such an extent that violence then erupts. So the victims, I just want to make this point, that the victims of knife crime in particular, but all crime as well, are also victims of austerity, right? They're victims of a society where the working class and the few, and the, where the working class, sorry, and the youth are facing a future of misery. 
And I think this kind of hopeless future is why there is a deep mood of anger in society as well. There is a deep sense of resentment. And I think that is channeled towards the establishment. There's a deep anti-establishment mood that is gripping the minds of, of the youth and the working class in general. And we've got to channel that mood. We've got to channel that anger and organize it around a fight to bring down this Tory government, channel that anger against the Tories in an organized fashion and elect a radical socialist Labour government with that process as well. We know that the student movement is at its strongest when linked up with the working class. Today's students are tomorrow's workers and our interests are fundamentally the same. And that is why, for example, we welcome the incredible vote of the CWU and the postal workers who smashed the um, draconian anti, um, Tory anti-trade union laws recently um, with an overwhelming 97% vote for strike action. And we need to be at those picket lines supporting those workers. I know in Swansea already, they organized a meeting where they got a postal worker to come to the university and speak to the students about the need for support. And I know that they passed unanimously a motion calling on the students to organize solidarity on campus, to go down to the picket lines, to call on the student union to be responsible for this as well. And that's the sort of thing that we need to see replicated throughout the country. Because this strike, the strike of the postal workers in particular, has the potential to send shockwaves throughout the entire labor movement. These postal workers aren't striking just for themselves. That strike can represent something fundamental because millions of workers will relate to their struggle, will relate to the casualization that's trying to be enforced upon them by that management. And so we have to support those workers in that strike. Another example, of course, is the UCU, which is currently balloting for strike action. And in Warwick, I know they also held a solidarity meeting with various UCU reps. And uh, again, explaining the need for student solidarity in that strike, um, if it takes place. And if they succeed, we will support those workers again, because we know that these are not individual, isolated, separate disputes. And that the fact that they are happening is part of the wider attack against the working class that is taking place right now whilst capitalism is in crisis in this country. But also what I want to emphasize is that what these strikes fundamentally show is that there is a fighting mood that exists in the working class right now. And that is particularly true for the youth. When we look at the 2017 general election, for example, we can see how important the student vote and the, the youth vote really was in that process. The turnout amongst 18 to 25 year olds came to 72%. And that is an incredible increase on the average of 40% across the last four elections. And that is what that general election became about. The youth surge, the youth quake that everyone spoke about. And that is why we've launched this initiative. That is why we've launched Students for Corbyn because it's clear that students need to be organized. They need to be mobilized on campus to kick the Tories out. Just to give an example, in 2017, the seat in Canterbury went Labour, despite the fact that it had been Tory for 100 years because the students were organised and went out en masse to vote Labour and kick the Tories out. This is what we need to see replicated throughout the country in the general election that's coming soon, um, most probably. And so just an example of that, we're organising in Brunel University, actually, which is in Uxbridge, Boris Johnson's constituency. So in the last election, Boris Johnson's majority was halved. It was brought down to about 5,000 votes. So the students there are organising. They've had one meeting already where the prospective parliamentary candidate came along, spoke to the students, spoke with the other Labour students about how are we going to register students to vote? When are we going to go door knocking? And how are we going to you know, use the potential of that university there to unseat potentially um, the, a prime minister in that sense? And that is a really powerful movement. That's the potential to pick up that, again, I think can be replicated throughout the country in various places. Another example, of course, is in Sheffield, where I know the Marxist Society and the Labour Society have already joined up under this banner of Students for Corbyn, and they've already gone around knocking on, on, camp, knocking on doors, on campus, organising students and getting the word out to vote for a Labour government. And I think that in all key marginal constituencies, we must be organising these radical students around a bold socialist programme. 
And I just want to emphasize the fact that these students, a lot of whom are already very radical, right? They're already radical and they are looking to Corbyn. Corbyn represents something. Corbyn, Jeremy Corbyn managed to transform British politics in quite a profound way. And this is despite all the smears and attacks and everything that they've tried to throw against him to prevent this inspiration, I think, that he's provoked amongst the youth and the working class more generally. And if we look at, for another example, at the incredible climate strike protests that have been taking place over the last year, all around the world, but also in this country, you know, we had hundreds of thousands of school students on the streets demanding system change, not climate change, and demanding a fundamental overhaul of the way our society is run. And I was at the last one in London that took place, which was huge. And Jeremy Corbyn spoke at that. He spoke to the crowd and addressed all of the students there and all their placards. And I don't think there are any other political leaders right now in this country that speak to the youth in the way that Jeremy Corbyn does. There's no one that's really comparable. And I think that that's because he offers something fundamentally different, a break with the status quo, which is overwhelmingly what young people are looking for. They don't want the same of the last 10 years, the 10 years of austerity and cuts that's destroying the planet, destroying the economy as they see unfolding before them. And what's interesting is that despite this huge fundamental anger and energy that we're seeing from young people and school students and university students right now, it's at this time that we've seen one key youth organization, if you want to call it that, Labour Students, dissolved, right? Labour the National Executive recently um, took the decision to dissolve Labour Students. And I think that this is actually a step forward. This is a step forward because Labour students was one of the last bastions of the right wing in the Labour Party, of Blairism and all that dull politics from the past that does not speak to or represent the youth in any genuine fundamental way. Where were Labour students during the climate strikes, right? I didn't see them anywhere. We were there, Corbyn was there, but where was Labour students? What have they done and what did they do to tackle the endemic mental health crisis facing young people that young people are yearning out for and talking about constantly? What have they done to protect students and the lack of services that they're facing in university and elsewhere? What did Labour students do in the fight against tuition fees? I mean, actually, Labour students had a really bad position on it and were in favour of a graduate income tax, right? And this is supposed to be the, the youth body of the Labour movement, the youth body representing the fight that, that the students feel need to take place. And so I think that the, the, the end of, of Labour students, its, its disillusionment, basically represents something new, right? It represents an opportunity and a new beginning. And what we would put forward is that we need a new democratic socialist Labour students that actually fights in the interests of young people and the working class more generally, that bases itself on working class politics, because that's the only way they can play a fundamental role in, in the, in the Labour movement and in, in, in wider society. Because there's plenty of good Labour student clubs up and down the country uh, with lots of young left-wing people. And I think they need a radical Labour students organisation to channel that and organise that into a, into a genuine force that could play a really powerful role, for example, in the general election. And that has to be based on a healthy basis, a democratic basis, class politics. And, you know, that's why we've also launched an open letter, you know, calling on all these disaffiliated Labour students clubs, because loads of Labour students disaffiliated from the national organisation because they were disgusted by what it represented. <laughs> and we've launched this open letter calling on people to sign up and agree to join this fight for a new, genuine socialist Labour students. And I would invite everyone in here to sign that and share it with youth officers in your CLP, young Labour positions, Labour students positions to really build something much more powerful and significant than what Labour students ever really was. You know, we're here at the Revolution Festival and there's obviously a revolutionary mood that exists amongst young people right now, but there is no serious leadership at the same time. And just another example of that that I want to give, at the NUS conference two years ago, um, which I, I, was a, I was a delegate at, the UCU was at the height of one of its most militant strikes in its history. We saw lecturers on the picket line coming out on strike for nearly a month. It was a really powerful movement and lots of students were on the picket lines there supporting the workers in, in, in their struggle as well. And in the midst of that Nash NUS conference, the National Union of Students did nothing to seriously mobilize students to support, to support the lecturers in that strike. And that is an absolute scandal. Where was the NUS and why aren't they taking a lead on the struggles that young people are facing right now? 
when they're so radical, when they're so ready and, and energetic and wanting to start in this fight. And I think we can't allow this to continue, ultimately. It's only by taking up the demands of students, it's only by taking up the demands of young people that we can fundamentally transform society. And I'd say that the Labour Party now must commit itself to those demands from young people. It must commit itself to what we're saying. If we take climate change, which is clearly an a international issue that has gripped the minds of young people in quite a profound way, if 100 companies produce 70% of all emissions, that statistic, then the Labour Party must nationalise those companies under workers' control. And those are the demands and the policies the Labour Party must be coming out with, speaking to those students and meeting that anger and that energy and transforming it into something that can actually change society, actually change the material conditions that are facing us today. System change, not climate change, was the slogan of those climate strikes. The Labour Party must be the party of system change. I think, and also, you know, I was also at the, the Labour Party conference quite recently, which um, came out with a lot of really great radical policies, a lot of great policies that I'm sure are going to speak to a lot of young people and, and, and the, wo the working class more generally as well. And one such example was to abolish private schools, this promise that they were going to uh, abolish uh, private schools. And that's great, right? Absolutely. Those are the kind of policies that the Labour Party has to be going into the next general election with. Yes, <coughs> abolish private schools, but I also think we can go further with that. I think the task of a socialist Labour government must be to abolish all barriers that exist in society to separate the working class and deny the working class from access to the best of what the world has to offer. Why is that held privately and why is that not shared amongst all of us? And that has to be the task of a socialist Labour government. And I think that this generation of young people and the energy that we've seen from them, if organised with the working class, will be the generation that gets Labour to power on a socialist programme. And that can be the first step in ending capitalism and the misery that it's caused for so many and the beginnings of building a socialist society. Comrades, uh, comrades, sisters and brothers, it's, a, it's an absolute privilege to have been invited to the Socialist Appeal. I've now got a full house of conferences that I've spoke at, so, so I'm really proud of that and I'm really humbled uh, to be in your presence tonight, and especially you, Rob, because obviously you know, I, every, time I, every time we speak on a platform, I close my eyes and think an eye, Bevin. Um, and that's a real big thing for me, you know what I mean? Um, I'm, I'm just ashamed that I, I, was, I wasn't alive before, before he died, unfortunately. Um, but listen, it's, it's been an absolute uh, privilege to work with your organisation on the, the Labour for Clause 4. I think, I think uh, the campaign uh, to reclaim the Labour Party for the working class is, 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 is a campaign um, that, that absolutely speaks volumes for the need for, for a working class voice uh, right across our country and, and actually across the world. Um, but I come from the Baker's Union. Uh, I mean, a, a lot of people think our union's new. Uh, which sometimes surprises me because we've been there since 1847. Um, the, the, the BMA is the only organisation that's older than us, uh, but we are the oldest trade union and the longest affiliate of the, of the Labour Party too. But today, I don't know if anybody's seen it, um, I don't know if anybody's seen it, we, we've demonstrated even more about how radical of a trade union we are. And, and, I, and I, and if you've got a drink, raise your glass because we've just elected the youngest ever female general secretary of any trade union in this country. So Sarah Woolley. And I congratulate all of our members who took part in that ballot because she's a fast food worker. She came from Greg's. She was 16 years old when she started uh, working Greg's and 16 years old when she became a, became a member of our trade union. We're really proud and privileged that she's demonstrated, even as a single mother, that barriers can't stop you from progression. And, that, and what she's going to do as a, as, a, as a general secretary for our movement uh, will be inspirational to us all. And uh, you know, like I say, you know, I, nof I wish her nothing but, 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 but well. Um, I mean, I think, I think from a trade union perspective, the idea of, 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 of removing a lot of the uh, white uh, middle class uh, bureaucrats of trade unions is a good thing. I don't know how you feel about that, but I think that's a great thing, actually. And I think it'll make our movement so much better. 
For, for many people tonight, I realise this is our first time of meeting. So, so obviously, if I get too radical as a, as, a, as a national officer of a trade union, I understand you're used to bureaucrats. And uh, if it does, just let me know and I'll go back to the simple stuff. Um, but the thing about the Baker's Union is this, is, is that we recognise which class we're from. We know where we've come from. I mean, there's, there's, there's different brands of people as well. I mean, when you, when you look at society at the moment, it's very... It depends which position you take. I think it's a very historical moment uh, for, for, for British politics. I mean, some people, you know, uh, look, at, look at the situation that we're faced with and are pretty pessimistic about it. Um, some people, you know, obviously looking at a glass, for example, would say, that glass is half full. And then you've got the others, you know, people like Jeremy Corbyn or John MacDonald and those people like that who would see that same glass and think, that glass is, that, that glass is half full. And then you've got the realist, which is I always put the category of the Baker's Union in. And the reason why we see that glass, and when we look at that glass, is we say, that glass actually has room for two double vodkas and a, a couple of ice cubes. Because um, I am celebrating, so, so it's a privilege to be here. But listen, obviously, you know, I'm, I'm proud to also be in the room with some of my colleagues and some comrades from the fast food campaign who've just been organising workers. Uh, and I'm very proud and privileged to, to always go out with Gareth. Uh, Gareth has been leading our campaign and led the very, very first strike uh, of McDonald's uh, a couple of years ago, um, actually. It was 2017, I believe, wasn't it, Gareth? 2017. Yeah, you know, you were 10 years, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we age you. Um, but it's been an absolute privilege to be on that campaign. And, and the people, people who have ever come, and obviously I see the McDonald's t shirt there, so it's, it's really nice to be in a room where I feel welcome. Um, but people who have been involved in that campaign, and I've ever met any of those workers or listened to the stories that they tell could never, could never not be inspired about the decisions that people make with no rights, you know, with no contracts, who are insecure in their employment, who are vulnerable in their lives, but decide to get up and stand up and actually do something about it. These are inspirational people. You know, I, I remember going to my first OC meeting, which is what we call them, it's an Americanization of... Uh, of uh, organising. But I remember going and listening to the stories that those people told. I remember listening to uh, why people decided that they were going to join the union and they were going to take action. Stories like they, they didn't like the fact that one of theirs, one of their people that they worked alongside, couldn't afford to buy their children, couldn't afford to buy their children new clothes or new shoes and had to go to the second hand store. They didn't think it was right that someone who'd been abused in the workplace with mental health issues because they'd been in an abusive relationship, was then targeted by the manager when they returned, even though that manager knew, knew that they'd been in an abusive relationship and they were still on medication when they returned to that workplace, but thought it was, thought it was quite funny to insult and abuse them, to make them cry. And I listened to those stories about, I mean, people would have, hopefully people would have seen it on BBC, where, where one of our young, young members, Tyrone, I mean, he brought a new world to me, actually, Tyrone, where he explained to me about sofa surfing, because I'd never heard of it, but it's a thing that happens now for young people. Far too many young people. Where he slept on sofas and he slept on cars because his mates put him up, because, you see, when he started work, he was doing okay. He was on a zero-hours contract, but we were getting 40 hours a week. A new manager comes in, cuts his hours because he doesn't like him, down to eight. Can't afford his flight. He was 17. He was 17 years old. 17. This is the society that we're living in today. And this is the politicians that have got the opportunity to change things for us but fail to do it because they don't think we're relevant. And that's why it's our job to understand what our role is in our, in our movement and in our class. That's why it's important that when we support the McStrike, we understand what it's all about. Because McStrike is not about just McDonald's workers. It's about all of those workers who are exploited. It's about all those people who are on zero hours contracts, all those people who are on, on low pay, all of those people that rely on food banks, all of those people who are homeless, who are veterans. We celebrate them when they go and fight in wars and we, we commemorate them every year. Then we leave them on the streets of our cities and towns without the mental health support they need because we don't think it's an investment that's worth it because once they've stopped serving our country, we don't believe it's necessary to invest in them. 
And if we do that to people that serve and to fight, just think what they're doing to all of those people that don't. And that's why this movement is so important to understand our role of it is incredibly, incredibly, incredibly important. The roles that you play this weekend in your conference, because it's not just about being at conference, by the way. It's not just about being at conference and taking part in the debates, it's about what you do afterwards. It's about the society we build. Because the society we build, we have to understand that we stand together in solidarity, yes, but we stand together to build a world that's fair for all of us, to end injustice and to build and to create an opportunity to end inequality. I mean, the Labour movement, in my opinion, has been getting it wrong. And I'm going to talk about Brexit in a minute because I think it's important because it's, it's a misdirection about what's happening in our society. Because what we've been seeing while we're all concentrating on breakfast, Brexit, breakfast, Brexit, <laughs> is 130,000 people dead. 130,000 people either starved to death, denied their rights to benefit, that the welfare system that we as a people created to support has been taken away from them. 130,000 dead people. Where is their voice in Parliament? Where are those politicians standing up for their rights and for their families? We have a job to do as a people to make sure that their deaths were not in vain. We have a job as a movement, as an organisation, to understand our role in building a fairer society and a better world to live in. We mustn't ever forget those people were sacrificed in the interest of lowering taxes, of improving the establishment's position to control the media and the narrative around how we live. Our job is to recognise that and explain that to the people we work alongside. That's our job. And that's your job this weekend while you're here at this conference. Because we have to understand what's being done to us. While they distract us with Brexit, while they say the most important thing is Brexit, the reality is there is a million people on zero hours contracts. There is more people now on minimum wage there are more people now not under a collective agreement because the trade union movement has, has been absolutely smashed. While we all believe, and while we kept getting told by the bureaucrats in the trade union movement, that the European Union is the organisation we need to be with. This has happened in a society that's been part of the European Union, and I don't believe whether we're in it or out of it, makes a blind bit of difference to where we are as a people. What we, under, what we have to understand is our strength doesn't come because politicians grant us something. Our strength and our decisions that we make in our life happen when our lives improve because we recognise our strength comes from standing against, alongside one another. You know, we have on our banners in McStrike, by the way, we don't have workers of the world unite. We have workers from wherever you are in the world. We stand together in solidarity because we don't believe, and this is where the freedom and the movement or argument of the Labour movement has been totally wrong. But, but when Tony Blair and Ed Miliband and all of those people decided that it was justifiable to turn around and say, you know, the issue and the hardship that we face is because of migrants that have come to our country. And the Labour movement, unfortunately, didn't oppose that, that was a huge mistake. It was a huge mistake because you know what? This world belongs to us. It doesn't matter where you're born. The freedom of movement shouldn't be attached to a trade deal. Freedom of movement is our right as human beings to live wherever and love wherever we want in this world. We have a right to it. It's our rights. And we should never allow people, just because they've got elected into power or they have money, decide on how we live our lives. Our job is to make sure that people we work alongside, people that we meet, and I've got to be careful with this because once the Daily Mail decided I called for the indoctrination of children, all I said is when you pick your kids up from the school ground, talk to the parents. But when I answered the question to the Daily Mail, what I did say, I think political education for children would be good so they know what they're playing in a democratic society because we're supposed to be a democracy, you know. Because democracy is important, but our rights as people is more important. And it's our coming together and understanding the roles that we play in society that enable us to change. Look at our history. I mean, this year we commemorated 200 years of Peterloo. 200 years of a long march of democracy. 
200 years, and 200 years ago, like the, ex like the Extinction Rebellion of founding out, is what the establishment do when workers come together from whatever category of life you want to put them in. Is they always send people in to demoralise us, to attack us, to arrest us, and 200 years ago to kill us. Because they understand if we come together and recognise our strength comes from our collectivity, then we can change society. Look at what we've done. Look at what happens when we recognise our strength comes together. Look at what we've achieved. I mean, they told us men couldn't have the vote because they didn't have the right intelligence and they didn't have the right financial background. We stood up and we fought back and we won it. Look what women did when they demanded the vote. They won. Look what happens when we as a people come together after the First World War, and people, people, you're probably more, I mean, obviously I'm on with Rob, so I mean, he can, he can probably tell you more than I can. He can go into the Chartists and all of those sorts of, sorts of uh, you know, historical events that's happened for working class people. But we came back after that war, we was promised a different world to live in. And we got more austerity, we got more division, we got more poverty, so we went and ended up in a Second World War. A Second World War that was about fascism. And we as a people came together because we recognised we had to defeat fascism. Because our strength doesn't come from standing alone. Our strength comes from standing together. And we recognised to discriminate against one is to discriminate against all. And we stood up. But when we came back from that war, what we demanded was a change to other society in the lives that we had. And we elected a Labour government a Labour government that delivered a welfare state, that ended the homelessness situation, that said we had the right to work and full employment was our aims and objectives, but not just, not just our right as a people, but just a, a right for a contract which came alongside terms and conditions of employment that guaranteed also union rights. We as a people demanded change, and we as a people got it, because we understood that by standing alongside one another, that's how we won. We don't win when we believe our strength comes from individuals, because that's what they tell us, isn't it? For the, Thatcheris, the Thatcherism era is that, you know, if you can't stand on your own two feet, then you're weak. Pull yourself up by your shoestrings. That's not true. We win when we realise our strength comes from collectivism. When we recognise our strength comes from standing alongside the person next to us, regardless of where they were born, regardless of who they are, we are stronger when we are together. And as a movement and as a people, we can change the world if we put our minds to it. And what I want to convey this message to you this, this weekend is, is that revolution, you know, is an amazing thing to talk about in a bar. But it's in our hands. It's in our grasp. We can change the society we're living in. And at the recent Labour Party conference, what we were given was the policies the policies that will change everybody's life. And it's our job to go out there and explain that to the people in those workplaces, to the people we get on the buses with, to the people in the school grounds, to the people in the supermarkets. Because it's all right having policies if people don't know what they are because they're blinded by the bias of the media. The society that we want to achieve will never change. So your job this weekend is to make sure that you listen, take part in debates and have a fantastic time. But to go back from this conference and to take a message of hope. When we come together, there's no stopping us. When we as a people stand up and recognise our strength is unity, we can make a huge difference. And our job, our job is to recognise our strength comes from our solidarity. Solidarity. Well done. Task uh, this weekend is clearly to to uh, prepare ourselves uh, for the events that are coming, and uh, it has been a great uh, pleasure for myself to, to to be with you in particular, holding meetings uh, up and down the country. We were in Darlington last weekend, uh, defending the ideas of socialism and the, the struggle to change society. And we always make the point that this is a, a struggle that uh, wasn't, didn't begin with ourselves. 
it goes back a, a long way. The, the struggle for the emancipation of working people. And yes, we do commemorate uh, historical events, it's true. Uh, I know going about the Chartists and, and the, uh, the Levellers and so on. So we do stand on, 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 the, on the shoulders of these uh, struggles. But of course, uh, it's now our turn. And uh, we have a particular responsibility to learn about the the victories and, and, and the, the failures of the past, so that we can strengthen ourselves for what is to come. And it's clear if you just turn on the television or listen to the radio, that the, ter the, the world has been turned upside down. In fact, that was a, a pamphlet written in the time of the, of the level, as I remember, when uh, the period of the, of the the 17th century, where Britain and, and Europe was in, also in a period of turmoil because the old system was breaking down and a new one was crying out to be born. And in reality, we're, we're in this same situation today. This tremendous instability, this turmoil that you see, not only in Britain, but internationally, is really a, a product of the crisis of the capitalist system, the impasse of capitalism. Of course, we had the, the big slump of uh, 2008, which was a watershed. It was the deepest economic slump of capitalism probably in its history. And yet we have not recovered from that crisis. We've not recovered from that slump. We're still feeling the effects today. And therefore we have this Austerity and attacks, not just in Britain, but everywhere on the working class. They may be made to pay for the crisis of the capitalist system. But of course, this austerity has its limits. People are being driven to the wall. And really, they have to fight back. And what you see taking place internationally is workers saying enough is enough. And therefore, you see revolutionary developments at the present time, which give us, gives us great heart. We showed that we, our class is prepared to fight back in Chile, in Ecuador, in Catalonia, in the Lebanon, in Iraq, in Hong Kong, and many other places. It's quite remarkable. It's like... Uh, you know, waiting for a London bus, you wait a long time, and then suddenly quite a few turn up. <laughs> and this, uh, uh, but that's what you have at the present time. Uh, and why is it? We have to ask ourselves, why is it that there's a series of revolutionary crises occurring simultaneously? And again, that's the, a deep reflection of the crisis of the system itself, manifesting itself in the struggles of the working class. I do remember, of course, in 2008, 2009, commentators saying, well, you've got a deep crisis of capitalism, but where's the struggle of the working class? Where's the revolutions? Where are they? Well, of course, uh, it does take time uh, to recover from such a, a crisis where people begin to think for themselves and realize that they have to struggle. And therefore, these cynics and commentators can see today, well, they saw, anyway, many years ago, the Arab string was, a, was the first stirrings of opposition to capitalism. But now today, country after country, you see a movement against the capitalist system, against the status quo, and that is a reflection of, this is of the, the period that we have entered, and in Britain in particular. I mean, Britain of all countries, sleepy Britain, where nothing much happened until now. And the Britain has been transformed from the most stable capitalist country in Europe to the, probably the most, one of the most unstable capitalist countries. Again, a reflection of the crisis of British capitalism, and we are connected to the world system itself. Of course, uh, we have to understand that 
this uh, crisis manifests in different ways. It's the symptoms that we have to look at. And you even look at the Tory party. After all, the Tory party was probably the most successful conservative party in Europe, if not the world. It was seen as a, a means of stability in society. And yet how the Tory party has been turned upside down, poisoned not only by Brexit, but also reflects the degeneration of the political representatives of the ruling class. We always knew that the, the leaders were different from the rank and file in the Tory party. The Tory party ranks were full of very reactionary people. We used to call them the, the hang em, flog em brigade. Such was their, their particular views on society. But as long as they were just the rank and file and were kept in their place, it didn't really matter. Only problem, they were given the vote in the Conservative Party. They could now vote for the leadership of the Tory party. That was a big mistake. Because rather than the more mod so-called moderate leaders of conservatism, which, are, which was a feature of the past, now we have the more reactionary elements which are coming to the fore, and particularly of Boris Johnson, who after all is, uh, how can you say? Well, Johnson's out for himself. He's supposed to represent a party, the Conservative Party, which is the party of the ruling class in Britain. It was the party of the capitalist class in Britain and protected their interests. But such is the change in the situation, it's quite incredible. I read in the Financial Times of what, about 10 days ago, in the editorial, court, which is a, a big business newspaper, calling for the overthrow of the Boris Johnson government. How remarkable, big business attacking the big business, so-called big business party. How things have changed because of the, the fact that the Tory, the Tory party has been taken over, not by people who are now represent the interests of big business, but themselves. And uh, Johnson, of course, is very, he's, uh, he's a maverick. You know, he's a bit of a clown, isn't he? Although you've got to be careful, you mustn't use that term, I understand, because uh, the British Association of Clowns have uh, protested <laughs> that describing Johnson as a clown brings their preparation into disrepute. <laughs> but we know uh, what kind of uh, uh, character he is. After he's from Eton, therefore he's a bit, a, a bit of a rotter, shall we say. You know, he's, a, he's a rotter. Uh, that he represents his own personal interests and therefore doesn't care about uh, whether it's Brexit or a hard Brexit or anything else, as long as he is not in number 10. So they've unleashed, though, this uh, mood in society, this bitterness in society, because there's a lot of anger around, a lot of bitterness around, which is reflected in many ways. It was reflected in the Independence referendum in Scotland, where, what, 45% voted in favour of independence. They thought it was a kick against the establishment, a kick against the status quo. Brexit even is a, a reflection of a, a mood that, after all, didn't all the parties and all the establishment say, do not vote for Brexit? Brexit? <laughs> Breakfast again, mate. <laughs> and yet it managed to win a majority. So this is an earthquake, if you like. It's a reflection of the discontent in society. And the ruling class has lost control of the situation. That's the reality. They've lost control of the Tory party. And now they've lost control over the Labour party. Because the Labour party has been under the control of the right wing nearly since its inception. And it was through the right wing that big business controlled the Labour party. The Labour Party was in safe hands for capitalism. And everything was fine. And they could alternate between Tories and Labour because it didn't make any fundamental difference. And that gave stability to the system. But now, it's all gone. The stability has vanished. They've lost control of the situation. 
and the victory of Corbyn, again, is a reflection of this anger in society. Because once they allowed individual members of the public to vote for three pounds in the election, then that turned the situation round in 2015 and Corbyn was elected. And what, nearly 500,000 people joined the Labour Party. That's an earthquake, actually, because the Labour Party now has more members than any political party in Europe. It's the biggest party in Europe. Again, a reflection of the underlying mood in Britain at the present time. Of course, uh, we know that the victory of Corbyn was uh, the first step, and there's been big changes. And uh, we were proud to participate in those changes. Bringing back Clause 4 was one of them, which had been thrown out by Blair in order to, and replaced by, by praise of the market and praise of competition, and Blair wanted to change the Labour Party into a, a second Tory party. Break the trade union link, change the name, which he did, to New Labour. But he hit the buffers. It wasn't completed. And then we had the un un unwinding of this process. And now we want to bring it back. And therefore, Jim Zier, Jim Brooks here, who moved the resolution uh, on Clause 4, and not just... What I, what, I, what I was uh, amazed, though, was the fact that the response, because Jim got up there, I can, and uh, people have been talking about constitutional questions, rule changes, oh goodness knows what, and Jim talked about what Clause 4 was, socialism, Blairism, socialist plan of production, and a standing ovation he had because it, it, it connected with the mood in the party, rank and file. And that's why we said 62% voted in favour to bring back the original word in against the national executive of the Labour Party. Now that shows uh, a lot of uh, potential, shall we say. It was the unions that uh, didn't come on board and therefore they went for some working party. All right then, we'll give them a working party. <laughs> we have uh, had a look. We had a, we had a, look, a look in, uh, in the archives. And uh, we've come across the words of Tony Benn. And I haven't got him in front of me. You'll, you'll soon uh, uh, get, get copies. But uh, very remarkable def redefinition, modernization of Clause 4, where he talks about the need for, for us as a task to bring about common ownership of the commanding heights of the economy and the democratic workers' control of working people, which would include the nationalization, he works it all out, of the land, of the banks, of the finance houses, and the big giant corporations that dominate the economy. <clears throat> so we, we've got a plan, we've got a plot, and it's going to be, what's it called? It's called the Ben Amendment. <laughs> the real Ben Amendment, the Tony Ben Amendment. And uh, we think this is, we've got to, we'll, we'll go down Labour parties, the trade unions, we'll go everywhere because the mood is changing and the possibilities are there. And of course, we will fight for a Labour government. We don't know when the election's going to take place. But when it's called, we will fight tooth and nail to get the Tories out and elect a Corbyn led. Labour government, but we also say, because we, we have a certain memory, particularly the older generation of Labour governments, where Labour governments have tended to basically attempt where there's a problem to patch up capitalism rather than overthrow it. And our task is to, well, br bring to the attention of the Labour movement that capitalism is in decline, that in the past, Capitalism was able to give us a few crumbs, a few reforms. We fought for them, of course, and we will fight also again for those reforms. But uh, we have to say now that capitalism is in a deep crisis and it's counter-reforms. 
That is why, not only in Britain, but everywhere else, they're under, we're under attack. So capitalism cannot deliver the reforms that we want. The only way of delivering the reforms that we want is to do away with capitalism and take over, yes, the giant firms, the corporations, the banks, and plan them in the interests of the majority of people. That's the only solution to generate the resources needed in order to finance these projects. In other words, we think that now, more than any other time, the relevance of change in society is there. More relevant than any other time. And we've gone, I know uh, Ian's the president of the Baker's Union, and therefore every time we have a meeting, we conclude by the fact we don't just want the crumbs off the table. We don't want just a piece of cake. We want the bakery. Is that not right? <laughs> and, and of course, uh, as Mike said, the job is not completed. We know. Well, Corbyn was, was elected by the overwhelming majority of rank and file members of the party, but the Parliamentary Labour Party is dominated by the Blairites, and they will, as they have done for the last four years, attack Corbyn and undermine him, stab him in the back. But that is their role. And big businesses look in them, to them in order to undermine a Labour government. And therefore, we have to put the pressure from below against them. We should have deselection. It's a shame, actually, that Corbyn, in 2016, when he was forced to stand for a second time by 80% of the Parliamentary Labour Party, who moved a vote of no confidence in him, he could have put it in his manifesto, if I am being forced to stand, fair enough. But if I win this election, every one of you MPs will also be faced with a re-selection as well. <laughs> but when we say you know, these ideas are more relevant, it's because it's of, of the crisis and the situation. And it's not us who are saying it. You know, uh, Mervyn King, who was the governor of the Bank of England, a week ago attended the International Monetary Fund Conference and spelled out there that we, I, I quote, the world is sleepwalking into a new economic and financial crisis. It's on the horse's mouth. He talks about the financial, financial Armageddon that is coming our way. And that is true that capitalism has had what, 10 years since the last slump. And another slump is, is, due, is brewing. We've already had the frictions on the world scale. And therefore, it'll be like an avalanche. And our, we must be prepared. We must prepare the movement not to give in to this, because that's always been the problem of bending the, lee, the knee when there's a problem capitalism has faced. We must use it in order to say we must put an end to the system. Because if capitalism cannot give us a decent house, you know, a decent wage, a decent education for our kids, well, our message is to hell with capitalism. And that must be the... <laughs> but to conclude, you know, there's a that this generation is more political than any other generation, the youth in particular, and they realize there's something fundamentally wrong. And therefore, we must pose the thing sharply. Either we move towards barbarism or socialism. It was said by Rosa Luxemburg 100 years ago, and it's truer today than it was at that particular time. So therefore, we have to say, our task is in front of us. We have the ideas. We must connect these ideas with the struggles of the working class and thereby, on the basis of events, we can win, yes, a majority for these ideas. So it's not socialism in 100 years' time, 200 years' time. 
It's socialism in our lifetime. We must fight for that. That's our aim. That's what we'll accomplish.